There are places out there you can't find on any map. They're not gone. They're just lost. Hey guys, and welcome back. This is Autofocus, and I'm Steven Streeter. Today, we're going to take a look at how the creators of Uncharted the Movie made a video game film failing to use its source material when writing for its characters. Oh, to me, viejo. Let's try that again. Uncharted opens up in familiar territory, in a scene with our hero hanging out the back end of a cargo plane, struggling to survive. This powerful, action-packed open sets the tone for the rest of the movie, a fun action-adventure devoid of physics and reality that proves to be a cartoonish voyage in search for pirate treasure, but doesn't seem to reflect the kind of authenticity enjoyed in the game. I'm like literally in a Papa John's right now. Sully, we're running out of time! I found it. In the game, it all starts as Nate is discovered while crawling through the ductwork under the floor of a plane, when he is yanked up by a henchman, and during the ensuing fight, he ends up pulling the ripcord to a parachute attached to the plane's shipment. Caught in the path of cascading cargo, Nate finds himself hanging at the end of a truck outside the plane 40,000 feet above the ground, only held by a couple cables. This is similar to how it's handled in the movie, minus the fight and any form of interesting storytelling. The issue here is the writers had to figure out a way to get here from here. Remember in the game's plane sequence, Nate was alone and fighting a big bad dude all by himself when he resorted to pulling the ripcord for the cargo parachute in self-defense. While in the movie, you have Sully along for the ride, providing direction every step of the way. He even basically told Nate, hey, grab a parachute and don't do anything stupid. Logically, he would have grabbed a parachute and then done the stupid thing if that's what he wanted to do, so as not to seem completely naive. Now, don't get me wrong, there was some amazing stunt work here and we see our hero in his element, but to get to the cool stuff, the film is asking us to ignore some serious character flaws. Like, why didn't the writers just have Nate go for the parachute, then have him caught by the henchman before creating a deadlock between him and his captors? And after pulling the ripcord when he's caught between certain and uncertain death, there could have been a running gag within the scene, where he's struggling to get the parachute but is thwarted by the henchman again and again, only missing it by mere inches until he finally gets it, only to lose it as he's finally flung out of the end of the plane. Come on! That could have worked, even with Sully there, and would have made for a better connection between Nate and the audience seeing their hero trying to do the right thing, but being forced into making a difficult choice. But instead, we're given an impulse-driven character who acts more like a hormonally charged teenager than a mature adult in a difficult situation. Additionally, the creators of this film do a real disservice to the character of Nathan Drake by introducing him as a basic bad guy. Now, they do give him a touching story in the form of a flashback at the top of the film, but our present day hero doesn't seem to have any connection to it. He's someone without remorse who steals from unsuspecting victims and possesses really no praiseworthy characteristics that endear him to the audience aside from his boyish good looks and his youthful charm. A bartending mixologist and thief who doesn't even come close to resembling the Nathan Drake we know and love. This hero is so disconnected from his own story, it makes for an odd transition from self-serving bad guy to a trustworthy team player who is surprised when he is backstabbed by fellow petty criminals. <laughs> Based on the backstory provided by the film, it would have been more logical to meet young adult Nate following in his long lost brother's footsteps, investigating the same treasure his brother was searching for when he left him at the orphanage all those years ago. Growing into the character we know from the game, Nathan Drake, the legendary treasure hunter slash explorer slash historian. <laughs> but instead, we get a self-serving crook. Then there's the issue of Sully and how he and Nate became allies. This connection is a common thread throughout the Uncharted series and is so important that how it is handled is critical. So let's compare and contrast this moment in the movie versus the game. In the film, we first meet Sully as Victor Sullivan, a headhunter looking for an accomplice for his next job. Not interested, Nate dismisses him, only to realize that the bracelet he previously lifted was magically replaced by Sullivan's business card, with cell number, email, and physical address. While in the game, when Sullivan meets Nathan, Nathan is already on the hunt, already an explorer. He's an adventurer with a self-made journal full of notes, drawings, maps, and clippings. He's in purposeful pursuit when he finds in the museum's Sir Francis Drake exhibit the infamous Sick Parvis Magna Ring and its corresponding decoding device. This is when Nathan notices a man imprinting the lock on the display case, obviously planning a heist. 
In jeopardy of losing his prize, our young hero shadows the man, and after the display case key is crafted, Nate lifts it, and when Nate thinks he's in the free and clear, he comes face to face with Sullivan himself. Let's try that again. From this interaction, we learn that Sullivan is a skilled grifter for hire, and that Nate, while young and inexperienced, is clever nonetheless. They don't, in fact, become partners until Sullivan is met with a moral dilemma kill the kid or betray his boss. He chooses the latter, and via a simple dialogue, Sullivan and Nate build trust and create a partnership. So when you contrast how the game versus the movie handles this crucial character relationship, it begs the question, did the creators of this film even play the game? Sure, giving the two heroes a proper backstory probably would have made the movie a little longer, would have definitely cost more money, but would have been a whole lot more interesting, and would have certainly garnered more return on the investment. This movie just doesn't do these characters any favors. For instance, Nate's gratuitous relationship with alcohol in every possible iteration, from fancy mixology performances to just a bizarre alcoholic appetite that doesn't just border on the absurd, but is ridiculous. As though Tom Holland, the actor, is trying to prove how adult he is by drinking alcohol, hitting on the ladies, showing off his body, and just swearing randomly. He's a man now! In fact, his relationship with alcohol is so beyond reality, he even finds a 500-year-old bottle of something on a pirate ship and doesn't even worry about animal feces or viral transference. He doesn't even bother to wipe the mouthpiece before grabbing a quick swig of what could have been anything from 500-year-old rum to 500-year-old poison, spit, urine, you name it, we got it. No, this film's version of Nathan Drake needs it so bad he doesn't even consider the consequences of drinking a random bottle of whatever to get that fix. Next, there's Chloe Frazier, our femme fatale. In the film, she's portrayed as a tough criminal with a lone wolf spirit. She's an obnoxious woman who flip-flops her loyalty so much the audience suffers from whiplash. But in the game, she is portrayed as a strong, sexy woman with an unhealthy relationship with bad guys and a romantic history with Nate. And because of this history, she is put in difficult positions as she is forced to hide her loyalty to Nate whenever in direct view of her villainous partners. In the movie, however, the lack of chemistry between Nate and Chloe, along with the absence of strategic betrayals that are quickly resolved, just feels like the writers didn't do their research and don't understand the intricate balance between deception and stratagem. Finally, let's talk about the biggest letdown this film has to offer, Joe Braddock and the Bait and Switch. What we have in Joe is a character played by a talented performer with stunt skills and a strong screen presence, but the script dulls her down to a mere underling to a more powerful character played by the well-known Antonio Banderas, Santiago Moncada. Santiago's character is just more developed, as though he were pulled straight out of the video game's narrative. He has motivation, money, henchmen, and a backstory connecting him to the treasure going back for generations. Strictly speaking, he has everything he needs to be a major player for the run of the film. But the creators replace the perfect arch rival with Joe, a henchman suffering from delusions of grandeur. She just walks in and in the middle of Santiago's self-aggrandizing speech, literally cuts him off. Come on, Joe, how's he gonna pay us now? Joe is such an absurd choice as the main villain, it makes me wonder if perhaps Antonio Banderas was just too expensive to keep in the movie. Joe is written as just one big plot hole after another. She can't pay Moncado's crew of henchmen, and yet they follow her. Her only motivation is apparently greed, but feels more like revenge. She has no clear vendetta against Nathan or Sully, and so she is completely detached from any of the film's emotional stakes. And when she dies, it's so meaningless that after Nathan and Sully killed her, they don't give her a second thought. Even though she was supposed to be the one who killed Nathan's brother, so you think it'd be kind of a big deal. And when you compare her character to that of Santiago's, it's pretty jarring. Santiago was presented as such a solid character, I even found myself rooting for him even more than the actual heroes of the story. These are only some of the issues this film has to offer, but this video has to end somewhere. Suffice it to say, when making a video game movie, the story should at least resemble the diegesis of the source material. Don't just replicate a pirate adventure movie and slap some familiar names on it as a marketing ploy. We, the audience, deserve better than that. Well, that's all folks, it's been informative. If this content has been helpful or absurd, let me know what you think in the comments below. All opinions are welcome here. Until next time, this has been another Autofocus Journey. I'm Steven Streeter, catch you on the flip side. How about that?